Hope everyone's having a, a great morning. Temperatures are definitely getting warmer. Um, so stay cool, drink lots of water. Now we're gonna go ahead and get started. I see the numbers have climbed up. Um, welcome to today's class. Um, today's class is on controlling weeds, pests, and diseases. Today, um, you, the class will last about 45 minutes. Um, if you have questions, please go ahead and enter them in the Q&A box. I will, we will answer them at the very end. Um, if you want to directly uh, message me or John, you can do so using the chat um, feature. Uh, Santa Clara Valley Water, who we are, we are a full service regional water agency located in Santa Clarita. We provide water to approximately 273,000 people. Um, here's just some trout graphics. Um, if you're not aware yet, um, we are limiting watering days to three times per week, depending on your address. You could either water Monday, Wednesday, and Friday if you have an odd address. If you have an even address, you can water Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. Um, and if you need more drought resources, you can visit our website at droughtreadyscv.com. There's rebates, tips, and other things you can do. Most of our customers are cutting back and we can see that um, with our water supply. Um, and then here's another website you can go to for rebate programs, such as the lawn replacement program. Um, you can go to conserve.yourscvwater.com. Highly recommend um, if you're interested in removing parts of your grass. Um, I think the minimum is 500 square feet um, or 100 square feet now. It used to be 500. Um, so go ahead and go on the website and you can check that out. We do have a new um, SUV uh, friendly plant guide. Um, we worked with, or our conservation team worked with local nurseries um, to make sure that some of these plants are available. Um, and I will drop that link in the chat once um, I'm done presenting, so you can um, visit a website and see that. Um, and you can also request to get a copy. Um, you can get those at the nurseries. Um, they, we've dropped them off there. So if you need that resource, um, I'll, I'll drop the link in a bit. Um, we also have our Water Smart Workshop. You can save $20 on your water bill, um, get a credit just for learning how to um, read your water bill and identify leaks in your home. Um, it's a great resource to just to see if you have any leaks that you're just not aware of and you get $20. We do have our Smart Irrigation Controller Rebate. Um, it's $150 for it up to. Um, I highly recommend it. Most of them are in that price range and they do save you on your water bill um, because they don't water. Um, they have a schedule and if it's rained, um, which would be amazing right now, but if it would rain, it wouldn't water um, unless your grass needed it. Um, we do have uh, the lawn replacement program. Like I said, it's new and improved. There's native plant guide. Um, there's a native plant incentive. So if you use native plants, you get more money. Um, highly recommend looking into it, um, especially after today's class. We also have the help um, program where you can get up to $750 for upgrading your irrigation hardware. So if you convert to drip or high efficiency nozzles, um, one thing I wanted to mention really quickly is if you do have high efficiency nozzles, you are exempt from our three days uh, watering schedule um, because your lawn needs more than that. So um, I highly recommend uh, considering to, to convert to high efficiency nozzles. And then we will be on Zoom through the end of 2022. Um, and if you have any questions, please email me. Um, if you want a copy of the, of the presentation, please send me an email as well. I will drop my email uh, again in the, in the chat. So send me a, uh, an email and I will send you a copy of the presentation. Here yeah, um, some resources. And then our next gardening class will be on August 6th. And we're gonna do the top 30 plants for the Santa Clarita Valley. Um, and I highly uh, recommend you join us for that one. If you're thinking about doing a lawn replacement program or just converting, um, removing or adding some, some pretty native plants to your garden. I'm gonna go ahead and give it away to John. 
Um, he is the instructor for today. Thank you, Laura. You want to hit share screen, John? Yes, I did. And uh, I thought I had done that. Uh, I'll go to the PowerPoint slideshow mm -hmm. and hit share. And I think we're there. Excellent. Perfect. Okay. Very good. All right, uh, good morning, folks. And uh, today we're gonna talk about the dark underbelly of gardening, bugs and diseases and weeds. But uh, as you all know, if you're gonna do any gardening, you're gonna have to deal with those three problems at some point. So uh, we're gonna start with weeds because as you know, Weeds are going to grow almost anywhere. They're going to grow. Even if we don't water an area, we can get weeds coming up. But if we do water, we're going to get a whole lot of weeds. So uh, controlling the weeds is important for a number of reasons. One, uh, they're unsightly, but two, they do take water. So Eliminating weeds does help to conserve water. It uh, allows more water for the plants that you want to grow. And uh, there are many different descriptions of what a weed is. Uh, some folks just call a weed any plant that's growing out of place uh, or any plant that is more detrimental than beneficial. Uh, there are some weeds that might be desirable to some people. There's a weed called purslane that uh, you wouldn't want to get in your lawn or your flower bed, uh, but uh, it's actually um, edible. Uh, some people say it tastes uh, a lot like spinach. So, uh, so some characteristics of weeds is that they can produce an abundance of seeds. Uh, some of the ones that get in our lawn, like the uh, oxalis and the clover and the spurge, they, those weeds can be quite small and yet produce an abundance of seeds. And when we mow, we disperse the seeds. When we walk across the lawn, we disperse it. We even disperse the seeds when we pull the weeds. Um, so that's why eliminating them when they're quite young before they produce seeds is a good idea. And there are some horrible weeds whose seeds can remain dormant in the ground for a very long period of time. Uh, there's a weed called nutsedge uh, that I have read the seed can remain dormant in the soil for up to five years while it waits for moisture, while it waits for rain during dry years or waits for us to water, uh, then up it will come. So they do compete for water. That's very important. Uh, they compete for the nutrients also, and some of them grow so big that they can crowd out the plants underneath uh, and prevent the light from getting to them. An example of that would be that uh, new invasive grass species that we have here in Santa Clarita called Kikuyu grass. It sends out runners and it runs right across the top of our lawn. And it takes the water and the nutrients and it suffocates the lawn underneath it. Uh, not to mention it doesn't look very good. 
uh, and should be eliminated as soon on as possible. And then some weeds actually serve as hosts for certain pests and diseases. So here's a few of the common, in Southern California, we have two basic seasons. We have spring and fall. And spring can take us deep into summer and fall takes us deep into winter. And there are a few weeds that live in the winter. They germinate in the fall and they live throughout winter. Uh, and they mostly reproduce by seed and uh, the seeds wait for the fall and then up they come and they can come up by themselves in your flower beds, they can come up in the lawn. And in the lawn, they're best prevented. It's best to prevent these weeds by putting down what's called a pre-emergent on your lawn, typically in October, maybe again in February. So twice a year with a pre-emergent and it'll prevent some of these weeds from germinating. And now there's two of the weeds that I've already spoken of. On the right side is that purslane, now, like I said, which is actually edible. But on the left side of your screen, there is the spurge, and that is a scourge. That plant is very low to the ground, grows very quickly, produces hundreds of seeds. And uh, well, you can eliminate it by spraying herbicides. Uh, you just have to be aware that by the time you see it and spray it, it's probably already produced seeds that will be germinating in a couple of weeks time. There's a few weeds we have out here that are called biennial. They take two years to complete their entire life cycle. Uh, these usually are not a pest or a problem in lawns because we mow the lawns. Uh, but in fields and uh, dry areas, they can be a nuisance. Uh, thistle, I think we've all seen various thistles. We know what a nuisance they can be. Uh, mullein, I happen to get that up where I live. Uh, and it's very dry up here, uh, but uh, still manages to reproduce. Now, there are some what we call perennial weeds. And these weeds are weeds that last from year to year to year. On the left side of your screen, you see the kukuyu grass. And I've already talked about that. That's the one that runs across the top of your lawn and suffocates your lawn. The middle of your screen is Bermuda. That's a smaller stem and smaller blade. And it does the same thing. It runs across the top, it can invade anywhere flower beds, lawns, etc. And then on the right is morning glory or field bindweed. And I would hope that none of you ever get this weed. Um, I'm going to talk a little more about this weed. Uh, just give me one moment, please. So one problem with this particular weed is that it will climb up in between your ornamental shrubs. It's a vine and there's no way to eliminate this weed without eliminating your ornamental shrubs. So if you get this particular weed, uh, you're 
probably going to have to redo your landscaping. So like I say, I hope you never get this one. So these are some good cultural practices. Um, the first couple of things shouldn't be an issue, but the third line there, topsoil. Topsoil in bulk. If you're going to a bulk place, a place that sells soil by the scoop or by the yard, um, you won't know what you're getting actually. And uh, you could have some weed seed in there. You could have some vegetative parts of some of these perennial weeds. Uh, and then you're doomed. Now, if you buy bagged goods, uh, you're probably going to be okay because they've been composted and bagged. Uh, there's very little chance of getting weeds from a bagged product. Okay. Uh, and then you've probably heard of mowers bringing seeds from one place to another. But I have to tell you, the wind does that. The wind does it as easily as anything. So you can't avoid it. Uh, just fight them the minute you see them. And hand pulling is very efficient, of course, because you're generally getting the root uh, when you hand pull. If you're going to use a tool like a hoe or a shovel, try to get the root also. Um, sometimes if you simply cut the weed off, if it's a perennial weed, it'll come back. If it's one of the annual weeds, it won't come back. Okay. So uh, soil aeration, cultivation. Uh, if you do apply a pre-emergent to your lawn, you're probably gonna be okay. However, if you apply a pre-emergent to your flower beds or garden areas, when you turn the soil over, it, it destroys the effectiveness of the pre-emergent. So um, pretty much in your flower beds, if you're gonna use a pre-emergent, then don't go in with a rake or something and turn the soil over afterwards. Okay, if you're gonna, if you do have to turn the soil over, uh, apply your pre-emergence after you finished cultivation. Now, rototilling will kill off annual weeds. But the perennial weeds, especially the three that we talked about, the Kukuyu, the Bermuda, and the Morning Glory, uh, if we rototill those, regardless of how careful we are, we're going to leave some vegetative parts of those plants in the soil. And when that happens, they're going to sprout, they're going to sprout. Here's a couple of tips on how to prevent weeds in the lawn. One is to keep your lawn as tall as possible. Set your mower up as high as you can. The recommended height for tall fescue lawns is three to three and a half inches. So to keep your grass that nice height, you pretty much have to raise your lawnmower blade. Uh, if you mow the lawn too low, it'll weaken the turf and it'll allow the weed seeds to get into the soil. Um, some people like to do it once a year to, in the uh, winter to mow the, the grass down low and then apply a winter ryegrass. Um, if you have the tall fescue lawns like the marathon, uh, that's not a necessary step. The marathon can grow all year. 
and should be kept tall all year. Okay. Now, if you're of the ilk that you prefer not to use sprays, chemicals, anything of that sort, uh, then you can go out and rent a goat or some sheep to control weeds. Um, the difficulty with that, of course, is that the uh, goats and sheep can't tell the difference between the desirable plants and the weeds. So some chemical controls, we've already talked about pre-emergence. They prevent the seeds from growing. So that's a great way to go, prevention. You've heard the story, an ounce of prevention. It's worth a pound of cure, okay? Um, and like I said, if you do it twice a year, you're probably doing fine. After you do it, though, don't disturb the surface of the soil. They last about four to six months. So that's why if we apply them twice before winter gets here and before summer gets here. So as I mentioned, I think the two best months are probably October and February. And this will cut down on the number of weeds. Some weeds can't be prevented. A dandelions, for instance, because of that type of seed that they have, uh, that can't be prevented. Uh, so no pre-emergent will say it prevents dandelions and no pre-emergent will claim to prevent perennial weeds either. Um, now, if you have bare soil or a flower garden that you want to apply, a pre-emergent to apply the pre-emergent and then put a layer of mulch over the top. And this will improve the effectiveness and it'll last a little longer. The uh, pre-emergents do require water uh, to activate them. So to apply pre-emergents to acreage is very difficult and expensive uh, because Quite often, it's difficult to get out there and water to bring out the effectiveness of the pre-emergent. Now, some folks have had some success with corn gluten as an organic pre-emergent. But even on the bag, it will tell you that it only really stops a few weeds. Um, I think it lists maybe a half a dozen weeds that it may help to prevent. Now, some granular uh, pre-emergence, uh, there used to be one called a maze. Uh, the only one available now is called Preen, P-R-E-E-N. And uh, that is effective and it lists quite a few weeds, I think close to 100 or 150 weeds that it will help to prevent. Now, post-emergent controls are used after the weed has already sprouted. And there are different types of these post-emergent herbicides. And they work mostly by contact. Uh, some like clove oil or vinegar or citric acid, they will kill the part of the plant that it's sprayed on. Some products, you can spray them on the plant, on the leaf, and it'll be translocated through the plant system down to the root. These are the most effective weed killers. However, they take time. They don't burn the plant right away. Uh, I've had some people uh, tell me that they sprayed weed killer on the lawn or on the, the weed, and they call me the next day and say, the weed's still alive. To me, that's a good sign. That means the weed is pulling the weed killer down to the roots. It should take about 10 to 14 days to kill a weed if the weed killer does its job correctly. So. The selective herbicides mean just that. 
they're going to kill just a selective family of weeds. Uh, for instance, there are, there's a product called grass be gone. It will only kill grasses. That might be very effective in the rose garden. If you get grasses coming up in the rose garden, you can spray grass be gone and you'll kill the grasses, won't hurt the roses or the flowers. Then there are weed killers that will only kill broadleafed plants that are growing in grasses. These are the things we would use in our uh, lawns. Uh, so weed be gone is the uh, name of a product that will kill weeds and not grasses. Then there are specialty uh, chemicals and you have to ask for those uh, specifically. So it's good to know <clears throat> the weed that you want to kill. If you have any questions about that, bring a sample of the weed uh, into uh, your local nursery, a green thumb, uh, and they will get you something that will kill a specific weed without harming other plants. Uh, then there are the non selective, and they're going to kill both grasses and broadleaf plants. And once again, there's the contact, and then there's the translocated, which moves internally. Uh, so the best advice for eliminating weeds is water them, if need be, even feed them get them to grow so that they're nice and lush and then kill them. And as I mentioned, the good weed killers, the ones that are translocated down to the weed, they take some time to work. The ones that burn the plant and you see results in 24 hours, uh, probably haven't had time to work down to the root system. Okay. Now, there are products that you can say it's a, once again, fair ground that we don't uh, want anything to grow there for a while. You can use the preventers and the contacts at the same time, okay? There's also ingredients you can add, what, what are called herbicide helpers or stickers to the herbicide that will help to stick it onto the weed. Grassy weeds and some really difficult to remove weeds like ivy is a good example. Sometimes if you may have noticed that if you sprayed water on ivy or grasses, it beads up and rolls off. So the addition of a sticker will hold that weed killer onto the weed and give it time to be translocated through the plant. And then obviously don't water for at least 24 hours. Allow the herbicide time to work its way into the plant and then you can continue to water normally. Okay. Um, and obviously read the label, uh, particularly the directions for use. Uh, some weed killers, they will tell you not to use them if it's over 95 degrees. And uh, as you know, we're deep into summer. We've had a few 95 degree days, not too many. Uh, but I can assure you there are more ahead in our future. So, um, The label will tell you what plants you can use it on. It'll tell you what plants not to use it on. It'll tell you what weeds it will work on and what plants it can be used around safely. Okay, so that's it for weeds. And remember, if you have any questions about uh, 
any of the three parts of this presentation, you can uh, type them in. And at the end of the program, uh, I will uh, try to get to all of them. Okay. All right. So the next part of our program here is about insects, which includes insects, spiders, and mites, pests, plants. Almost every plant has some sort of pest that it will get at some point in its life. Some are harmful, some are not. We have to remember that, okay? Out of the 3 million types of insects that exist on this planet, only about 3% are considered economically important pests. That 3%, those are the ones that cause most of the troubles, and those are the ones that we want to control. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to control these insects, products to use, and some best practices. So first and foremost, try to identify your insect. Um, aphids are tiny little insects. I think everybody that has done any gardening has seen aphids and they can be in any color, white, green, red, black, yellow. Uh, they're small and a female can, fly in and lay youngsters that won't have wings. And in that case, those insects are gonna stay on that plant for basically multiple life cycles and reproduce on that plant. Now, while they don't kill plants, which might be interesting for you to know that, they don't kill plants. They do suck the juices from the plant and they secrete something called honeydew, which is a sweet material that the ants like. Uh, so if you have ants climbing up and down your plants or trees, it's because you have aphids somewhere up there. Okay. Now, the other thing to look for is perhaps curled leaves or distorted leaves, uh, because as they suck the juices from the plants, sometimes the leaves curl up a bit. Also the sticky stuff. If you feel sticky stuff on the leaves, you probably have aphids. The ants are attracted to the honeydew because they eat it. And the ants like the aphids because the aphids produce the food for the ants. Ants can't eat plants. So ants love the insects that can suck the juices from the plant uh, and then excrete the, uh, the honeydew. And in real bad cases, a sooty mold will grow on the leaves of the plants from the honeydew. So getting rid of aphids is, is very simple. I wish all insects were as easy to eliminate as aphids. You can buy foliar sprays. Sprays. I bet there's 50 different sprays on the market that you can just spray right on the aphid and it will kill him. And most of them are harmless to other insects. Uh, certainly they're all harmless to the plant. There are granules and liquids that you can pour in the ground around your plants if you don't want to spray. There are things you can simply pour in the ground at the base of the plants. The plant will take it up and the systemic products last up to a year. So you can keep your plants insect free. For instance, your roses, well, they make rose foods that contain a small amount of systemic in them. And that systemic will last from six to eight weeks and keep your plant free of insects. And then if you'd like, you can always buy ladybugs and lacewing and uh, release them at the base of your plants and they will climb up your plants and eat the aphids. Uh, just remember to release the ladybugs at night. 
because they only climb up. And once they get to the top of the plant, if there's no more aphids, they fly off. Now, a leaf hopper is a insect you might not ever see because they hide quite nicely. They're long and thin. They can be multiple colors and they don't move very far. And as the slide says there, they run sideways so they can hide behind the stems and under the leaves. They, the insect himself is only going to suck a little bit of sap from the plant. You've maybe seen trees in the evening that appeared like they were raining. Probably the droppings from these leaf hoppers. However, the real problem with them is they oftentimes will carry with them a disease, most likely a uh, bacteria. And as they feed from the plant, they inadvertently inject the poison into the leaves and then we can have problems. Uh, there's a related insect called a sharpshooter that is notorious for carrying diseases with it. The diseases don't hurt the insects, but they can kill plants and trees. Uh, if you have a liquid amber in your yard, you may want to go out after class and look up at the top of the tree and see if you have any dead twigs up there. Uh, that would be the sharpshooter. And uh, as he feeds, he inadvertently injects the tree with this bacteria, which is deadly. Then there's mites, and mites are different than other insects in that they have eight legs. So they're more closely related to spiders than to insects. And most insecticides won't control mites. So if you do get a mite infestation, make sure you use a miticide or a product that lists mites on them. The most common one is the red spider mite. And if you look underneath a high power magnifying glass, you can actually see them in their eight legs. Uh, another easy way to determine if you have mites is by the webbing. It's a very fine webbing, but you'll see it in between leaves on the stems and they damage a plant dramatically. In fact, quite often, on a tomato plant, for instance, if you get mites, the best thing to do is to cut that plant off at ground level, put it in a plastic bag and throw it away. If it's a minor infestation or it's just begun, there are some very safe sprays, oil sprays that will help to control them. Lace wings to a little lesser effect ladybugs um, and some predaceous mites might also be helpful to control them. The scales, uh, you'll find these on various trees and shrubs, and they look like little bumps, but the difference is you can pry that little bump off and you'll find it's actually a tiny little insect. They don't move, they sit in one place and they just stick their tongue in there and they begin to suck the juices from the plant. Uh, in heavy infestations, they could weaken the plant and turn it yellow. Um, and if not cared for, could have adverse effects on the plant. And most oil sprays, uh, neem oil, horticultural grade oil, sesame oil, uh, there are a number of oil sprays out there that you can spray on there and it will suffocate them. Uh, 
Uh, most other types of sprays can't penetrate that hard shell. Uh, the systemics are also uh, pretty effective on them. Now here's a funny little bug. Um, it's called a spittle bug. And you'll find this on three plants in your yard and typically only three, rosemary, lavender, and sages. And it appears as just a little ball of spittle, typically in between the leaves or where the leaf attaches to the stem. The insect himself is quite tiny and to see him, you'll have to wash off the frothy material and then you see a little black bug under there. If, now, in heavy, heavy infestations, uh, it may cause a discoloration or distortion of the foliage. Now, most times it doesn't. If you did want to control them, systemics would work or hose the plant off so that you wipe off the spittle and then spray an insecticide. Because remember that spittle covers him and protects him from sprays and from predatory insects. Now, caterpillars. There are dozens of types of caterpillars and they all eat leaves. That's what they eat. There are various types, various, some types of caterpillars only like certain trees or plants. You've probably, if you've grown tomatoes, you've probably had that great big old tomato hornworm. Or if you've had grown geraniums or petunias, then you're probably going to get the um, little green cutworm or one of the other worms that come from the moths that fly in. And once again, not too difficult to control. There are very specific bacterias that are harmful only to the caterpillar and not harmful to other insects or animals or people or the plants. So these are very specific. So this is kind of uh, an interesting way to go. You can spray these very safe products onto the plants that are infected with the caterpillars. The caterpillars will eat them and the caterpillars uh, then themselves get sick and can't eat anymore. And that's how it controls them. Now here's an insect and there are different types, including a new one uh, called a rose thrip. And as its name implies, it attacks roses and makes a mess out of them, just a mess. It deforms the leaves, it deforms the buds. It's called a chili thrip and it's a nuisance. And then there are flower thrips, which distort flowers. They chew on the bottoms of the leaves. And then there are very specific thrips one that likes ficus in particular. Uh, so these can be sprayed with systemics or you can use systemics in the ground. Uh, for the rose thrip, the chili thrip, the best means of attack is both. Use the systemics in the ground and a systemic spray. Uh, after you've had them, you'll understand why it's so important to uh, fight them. Now, white flies, and once again, there are dozens of types of white flies, some of them very specific. Uh, several years ago, there was a real problem with the hibiscus white fly. Now, we have a ficus white fly. And then there are just your everyday white flies that will attack fuchsias and geraniums and lantanas and <laughs> citrus and lots of other plants. And uh, once again, probably the best control is the systemics and try to spray underneath the leaves uh, because most of these bugs hide under the leaf. 
And then, of course, there's snails and slugs, and I think we're all familiar with them. Um, there are very safe but effective molluscicides that will control snails and slugs without harming anything else. Uh, you know, it's one thing about these drought years and the heat in summer. A lot of people tell me they don't have snails and slugs anymore because they prefer it moist. They love it when we water excessively. They love it. Uh, and they can multiply very quick under moist conditions, uh, but under dry conditions, they don't survive very well. Now, that's it for insects. Now, the last part of this is going to be uh, diseases. And I'm hoping you don't have to deal with these too often because some of these can be a real dickens. Um, some diseases like fungal diseases can be blown in the wind and you can't hide from them. Um, roses, for instance, are an example of a plant that will get a wind-borne disease called powdery mildew. And since they're blowing in the wind, your plant is in an area that um, is next to a wall or in a corner where the wind stops or the wind slows down, you'll get the disease. Out in the wind, where the wind is constantly blowing, uh, the diseases aren't quite a problem. Then there are bacterial diseases like fire blight. Um, and that happens on pear trees, apple trees, loquats, and crab apple. And that burns, that, it's called fire blight. And if you've ever had it, you'll know what I'm talking about because it actually burns the tree. And that can be spread by aphids or by bees, honeybees. When the plant is blooming, they can go from one flower to another and spread the disease. So. We have some diseases that are spread by the wind. Those are fungal. And we have some diseases that are spread by insects. And those would be bacterial or viral. Uh, so typically you will see signs of the disease and that will be, for instance, in the case of the powdery mildew, it'll be a white coating on top of the leaf. In the case of the fire bite, it'll be black leaves. Um, so you'll have to actually visibly see it. And by that time, your plant already has the disease and obviously will require treatment. Pretty hard to prevent diseases. If the wind's gonna blow them or if the insects are gonna bring them, pretty hard to hide from that. So here's a picture of the fire blight. And as you can see, it looks as though it was scorched by fire. There's only a few plants that it attacks, thank God. Um, but boy, is it devastating when it happens. And if you get it, you can, Keep the plant, but you do have to prune the diseased parts out, and then you have to sterilize your tool after every cut because it is bacterial. It does need to be physically moved throughout the plant. And you could inadvertently do that when you're pruning if you don't sterilize your shears. The uh, disease can show up as spots on the leaf or black stems. And this, is, this bacterial leaf spot is usually caused by excessive insect, I mean, excessive water. Um, once again, during the drought years, we don't get too many bacterial leaf spots. Uh, a wet spring can give us leaf spots. Uh, typically it is caused by excessive watering. And one of the best ways to control it is to reduce the watering 
then apply the spray. Now here's an interesting thing you maybe have seen, uh, especially if you have um, oak trees, you'll see these galls, which are these growths these, uh, that happen on the plant. And typically they're spread by an insect once again. And there's nothing can be done. If you get these things on a rose or a different types of plant, you can cut the disease part out and throw it away. But we can't do anything about the gall itself on the plant. Now, fungus, these are the most common diseases that we see. I've already mentioned the powdery mildew. There's also rust. And black spot rust would attack things like hollyhocks, roses, anything in the mallow family. And they start at the ground and work up. And they attack the undersides of the leaves. And uh, once again, when it's hot and dry, not so many problems. But when it's moist, rust can be more of a problem. Okay. Now, they have to receive their nutrients from an organic source. So for instance, mushrooms, they live off dead organic matter, uh, wood typically. So if you have mushrooms, it's simply an indication of wood in the soil. Uh, the mushrooms are not harmful, they don't kill lawns or things like that. Then we have some parasites, which are interesting. There's a few of those, you've probably seen mistletoe. And uh, there's another one, a wiry red plant that uh, you'll sometimes see on the side of the hills uh, that is a parasite living off of the uh, native plants. Uh, hard to hide from it, but the uh, best thing to do is once you see it, uh, attempt to control it. Now, this fungal disease called anthracnose is very common on many types of trees, especially sycamore and ash. It's more prevalent during warm, humid, overcast springs when it's wet and slows down the minute it gets hot. So this year, because we had a fairly dry spring, the anthracnose wasn't as bad. During wet years, it's real bad. And once again, you can cut out the worst stuff and then spray, uh, especially early in the season. When you know your tree has had a disease in the past, you can assume it's going to happen again. So spray early in the spring before the disease shows up again. Now, this is a, a fungal problem here that you may see on your purple leaf plum trees or uh, some other types of fruit trees occasionally, but mostly in the plum family, uh, occasionally peach. And once again, it's a fungal disease, seldom kills the plant um, and can really only be prevented once it's in the leaf. You can't do too much about it. Uh, if you get a serious amount of damage to your fruit and it your fruit gets kind of powdery, et cetera, that powder on the outside of the fruit would be the uh, fungal body. So it's best to eliminate those uh, and uh, break it up and clean underneath it before next year's leaves come out. And here's the rust we were talking about. And it looks just like that rust. In fact, sometimes you can rub your hands under it and that orange color will come off on your, your hands. Uh, once again, more common in the early spring uh, when it's moist. And uh, there are, like for instance, with snapdragons, there are some varieties that are perhaps more resistant uh, than others. And if you plant plants close together, that'll kind of trap the moisture and the wind in there, and it'll be worse. 
Once again, if the air can move through your garden freely, you'll have very few problems. Um, and of course, practices you can do would be watering just in the morning between 6 and 8 a.m. You don't have to water your flowers and plants, etc. at night. Okay, and here's the powdery mildew. I think we've all seen this. Uh, this is a pretty extreme case on the slide there, but uh, you'll find lots of plants, great myrtle trees, euonymus especially, and of course your roses and some types of trees. Um, believe it or not, you can blast a lot of those spores off with a strong stream of water. That's the truth. Uh, it used to be thought in the old days, it used to be thought that water on the leaves is what caused mildew. They have found that to be not accurate at all. In fact, quite the opposite of the truth. Watering the leaves will help to wash off some of the uh, powdery mildew. It's uh, spread once again by the wind, disease, and it loves it when we have warm, humid, overcast days. So that's why it's so much worse in the spring. Now, root rots and other types of rots where your plants just croak <laughs> when they just fall right over, uh, usually can be avoided by planting your plants at the proper height. In other words, if you try to push your plant down in the ground a little deeper than it was in the container, uh, you will probably get the crown rot. Uh, vincas, petunias, snapdragons, they're all very susceptible to this. It's best to keep the top of that root ball slightly higher than the surrounding soil. On little bedding plants, I would say a half an inch is fine. On bigger plants and trees, I'd like to see the root ball about an inch above the surrounding grade. And once again, water just in the morning. Uh, don't be afraid to let the soil dry, the surface of the soil dry in between waterings. If you keep the soil constantly wet, you will get a whole plethora of diseases. And uh, well, while there are some sprays that will help you with some of these, uh, it's also just a good idea to avoid the diseases. Okay. Now, verticillium wilt, this is real common on the camphor trees. Uh, Fortunately, it doesn't affect too many plants. So unless you have a camphor, you might not ever see this. And uh, sometimes the results look just like a root rot. And once again, excessive moisture is typically the problem. But uh, I think during this drought that we're having, uh, we probably won't have quite so many of these diseases. Then nematodes. So nematodes, most people have never seen them and probably never will, simply because they're almost invisible. And the only way you know you have them is that the plant will begin to do poorly. But to know that you have them, the only thing you can do is dig the plant out and look at the roots. I have only seen nematodes one time and that was in a vegetable garden where the plants weren't rotated um, so the nematodes were allowed to live in to multiply uh, on the same species of plant for a long period of time there are beneficial nematodes good nematodes that you can put in the ground you can buy them at green thumb nursery and put them in the ground and they'll kill the bad nematodes. Then here's some of those parasites I was talking about. Here's the uh, mistletoe, and they love to grow up in the sycamore trees. And then the yellow stringy stuff I was talking about is called dodder, D-O-D-D-E-R. And you might see it on the hillsides. Um, I know where there's several good patches right off the 14 freeway and off of Foothill Boulevard. Uh, 
And it's kind of pretty stuff. It's oranges and it's stringy and it climbs up into the plant and it kills the plant. Then there are some things that look like diseases, but they're really not. Uh, some of these things might be uh, deficiencies. Nutrient deficiency, mineral deficiencies might show up as weird colorations in the leaves. Uh, sometimes we burn plants with pesticides or insecticides by spraying them when it's hot outside or spraying them in the middle of the day when the sun is out. Um, then there's a few things that happen uh, simply because of fluctuations in temperature or fluctuations in the way we water. And then air pollution uh, can have an adverse effect on plants. If you live near a freeway or a busy street, um, you may have issues because of that. So cultural practices, ways to avoid some of these problems. Well, we've already discussed some of these. Proper irrigation, water just in the morning, skip days in your watering, don't keep the soil excessively wet. Fertilize lightly rather than heavily. Fertilize in the spring, not during the middle of summer. Choose healthy plants when you're buying plants. If you have a disease and you opt to remove or cut the disease out, disinfect your tools, dispose of the diseased things properly. Control the weeds as soon as you see them. Rotate crops, rotate crops. This is particularly important for things like vegetables. Um, you plant the same things in the same soil year after year, you're inviting problems. And then use resistant varieties whenever possible. Okay, If you're gonna use chemical controls, remember that there's preventative ones and curative ones. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. Now, I will go to the question and answers. So, first question here is, how do you distinguish morning glory? Well, it's got that little white flower and it's a vine that stays quite low to the ground until it finds a plant to climb on. Let us hope you never have to deal with that. Next weed is, next answer is Kikuyu airborne. Yes, it produces seeds and the seeds blow in. So uh, hard to hide from the Kikuyu. Uh, look up pictures of Kikuyu on the internet. Uh, to identify it, it is much more common than people think. Uh, is it okay to core a lawn or aerate a lawn? Uh, yes, it's a wonderful practice. It should be done uh, late spring before the heat of summer comes. Okay. Next question, are there chemical controls for Kikuyu? There are no pre-emergence for Kikuyu. There are only post-emergence. Uh, the only one I know of is called Turflon, T-U-R-F-L-O-N, Turflon ester. It will kill the kukuyu and not kill your grass. Our next question is about mosquitoes. Well, fortunately, there's a number of products that you can spray your entire yard with. The lawn, the shrubs, everything, and it will control the uh, mosquitoes and many of the other flying insects. Some of them are natural, some of them are synthetic, but that is the best way. Uh, simply spray the entire area. Uh, next question, can you give us the name of the weed sticker? It's usually called something like herbicide helper or herbicide sticker. You add that to your herbicides and it will make them more effective. 
Next question. Do leaf hoppers frequent crepe myrtles? They will go to any type of tree at all. They do not care. Uh, most often they don't do any harm. The sharpshooter has a wide range of plants and trees that it likes too, but it will carry a disease so far only to four plants, liquid amber, olive, oleander, and grapes. So, so far, we only know of four plants that are adversely affected. Okay. With powdery mildew on squash leaves, should the leaves be removed or pruned off? Um, should they be included in compost piles? You can compost them because compost heats up and will kill the the uh, mildew on the squash leaves. Um, some people will spray to kill the mildew on squash leaves. Some people will just let it be because the plant produces so many leaves that unless they're all infected with the mildew, maybe you don't have to do too much. Next question, why is it that commercial farmers can plant the same crop year after year without nematode issues? Well, actually, they have problems when they do that. They do have problems. And they oftentimes do cover crops. They'll do a bean or a grass or something else uh, after they harvest their main plant. But believe me, commercial farmers have problems. Okay? We Here's another interesting uh, question. We removed a Brazilian pepper tree a year ago, but it keeps sprouting. How do you get rid of the tree for good? Well, if you can't dig up the uh, root, then you're gonna have to dig as much of it up as you can, dig around it, expose it, and then put an herbicide directly over the stump and any cut parts. Brazilian peppers are a weed tree. They are very invasive. Now, obviously they shouldn't be planted, but if you have one, it is a good recommendation to take it down at the first sign and apply an herbicide. Next question, how long does grass be gone persist in the environment? Is it as bad as a Roundup? Well, uh, no, not at all. It is a selective. It will only kill the grasses and it works through the grass. So it doesn't have any effect on the soil. Uh, once the grass is dead, the uh, grass be gone is gone. Okay. Uh, next, is St. Augustine a form of Kikuyu? No, St. Augustine is uh, a desirable type of grass. It looks like Kikuyu. That's why I suggest you look closely at what you're calling St. Augustine. St. Augustine, you actually have to buy it and plant it. It does not produce a seed. You can't get St. Augustine into your yard unless you physically bring it in. Kikuyu will fly into your yard. Next, how do you control cutworms? Well, cutworms can be controlled by sprinkling things on top of the soil and watering it in. Uh, I know Spectricide makes a good product. Um, there's a number of bag products, a number of products that you can, uh, granules that you can sprinkle out over the area and water it in. Uh, the cutworms and other things like it, grubs, etc., are the offspring of various types of beetles, including the June bug and the fig beetles and uh, other types of beetles and bugs that are out during the summer, they lay their larvae, they lay their eggs in the ground, the larvae come out, and that is the problem. How do you control ants organically? Uh, boric acid and sugar water. Yeah, boric acid's natural. Uh, and then just mix it with some sugar water. You can buy products already made like that. Taro, for instance, makes a wonderful little bait station that contains sugar water and boric acid. It, it's a wonderful way to eliminate ants. Next question, for pre-emergent, how much water is required to activate at one time? A one-time watering thoroughly. So at least three eighths of an inch of water to activate your pre-emergent. Next question, how do I get rid of Japanese bloodgrass? Well, like so many grasses, grasses can be very invasive and blow in and cause 
all kinds of havoc because yes, they are difficult to eradicate. Many types, you actually have to dig them up and get the root system out with them. You can spray them with herbicides and grass be gone, et cetera. But if it's a real bad infestation, you may have to dig it out. Here's a question from Kara. How do you recommend killing a grass area where you want to plant a non-grass plant material? Well, actually, uh, almost everything we've talked about that is post-emergent, that kills after the plant is up, doesn't have any uh, lasting effect on the soil. So for instance, if you wanted to kill off some grass, you could use cleanup or any of a dozen things and kill it off. And then you could plant as soon as the plant is dead without any harm at all. Um, if it was specifically a grass that you wanted to kill, you could use grass be gone. And then once the grass is dead, Go ahead and plant. Here, can I spray grass be gone into my jasmine plant, which borders my neighbor St. Augustine and is growing if I yes, the answer is yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, grass be gone only kills grasses. Next, if you use spectricide for cutworms, can this be done in a vegetable garden? You would have to look at the label. I don't have a label in front of me to answer that question. I know there is a product called EIGHT, E-I-G-H-T, that is granular and it is used for flower and vegetable gardens to kill the cutworms. Next, any tips on grasshoppers? Hit them with a fly swatter. Grasshoppers are a dickens. There's no real good chemical means to control them. Um, most dust, like eight dust and seven dust seem to be the most effective for controlling grasshoppers. You put the dust on top of your plants and then when the grasshoppers come and eat your plants, they consume the dust and hopefully are then eradicated, okay? Now let's see, how long does grass be gone persist in the soil? It doesn't. Is grass be gone like Roundup? No, it is not. Uh, Roundup is a non-selective weed killer. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here, any other questions that I haven't answered. And I think we've gotten them all. Laura, do you see any questions there that I haven't gotten to? No, I think you got pretty much all of them, John. All right. Well, thank you very much, folks. I know that was kind of a long presentation, a lot of subject matter, uh, and uh, lots of good questions. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Um, and uh, hope to see you uh, next month. Yes. So we have these classes every month. and. Uh, they're always very informative and, and hopefully they, they uh, give you something to uh, work with when you're working out there in your garden. Okay, all right, Laura, is that about uh, all of the Q&A? Yeah, that was it. I just wanna thank everybody for taking the time to hang out with us um, this Saturday morning to learn about pest diseases and um, weeds. <laughs> Um, and I hope to see you all on August 6th, and we will be talking about the top 30 plants um, for the Santa Clarita Valley. So, um, and then one more thing, um, this presentation will be available on YouTube um, in about a week. So if you're interested in rewatching it, um, it will be available on our YouTube channel and our website. Yes, very good. That is correct. Should we, uh, all of these things are recorded, so you can go back and watch any one of them. You can watch them from several years ago. Uh, and hopefully learn something new each time. All righty, folks, thank you very much. Have a great day and happy gardening. Bye-bye. Uh, bye.